So I'm going to do something interesting, which is talking about the different configurations of long-lived order that you can get to spin half systems. And I'm going to go over some of the theory of that and also show uh, some uh, very nice experimental results. But, uh, while I'm very honored to be invited to this conference, and especially among such uh, brilliant speakers, what I'm going to do is uh, actually apologize. Because uh, this is a parahydrogen conference, but I'm not going to be talking about parahydrogen. That's all. So uh, some have drawn uh, what has been called a virtuous triangle. And let's say that uh, all you guys are uh, over here with pH2 and maybe a few with hyperpolarization. And I'm all the way at the other corner, which is this uh, theory of a uh, long-lived spin order. The, let's say some problems we have in all fields of physics. And I guess also that's how a uh, parahydrogen ended up everywhere. Is that two fundamental issues we have is uh, that you have a supreme constraint on uh, what physical interaction you can detect and you can exploit. And a lot of that has to do with signal to noise. The second thing, which uh, I'm going to be talking about more, is that the universe is entropic and you're going to lose all, all your memory eventually. So the first problem I'm not going to talk about at all. This has nothing to do with me. I don't know how you can get more polarization, so sorry about that. But the uh, second issue over here restated in NMR language, which is that you have a limiting factor on your storage times for uh, hyperpolarization, that being nuclear spin relaxation, and how you can extend that. So I'm going to start with some uh, pretty cool results. And uh, what you see here is a uh, bunch of uh, spin systems. There are these derivatives of 13C2 labeled uh, acetylene dicarboxylic acid. And what we've done here is we've uh, changed the esters sequentially uh, on only one side of the molecule. And this asymmetric substitution basically gradually introduces a larger and larger uh, chemical shift difference. Eventually, uh, getting you to different regimes of a uh, chemical equivalence. And the spin dynamics of these systems uh, can become uh, dramatically different. And what's going on here is that all of these signals were basically uh, signals that were generated from thermal equilibrium and then stored as singlet order at a low field of one belief Tesla. And this storage uh, is basically 100 minutes we could have uh, gone on longer, but uh, basically these experiments are taking too long. So before we go over what's going on here, I'm gonna give you the short answer and say, uh, well, the reason why it's so long is not because of some uh, amazing new pulse sequences or some amazing new uh, spin order. Uh, the reason why is that uh, it's simply very, very careful degassing. So uh, that's the short answer. And the fast answer is going to do with uh, what sequences you use to actually access long-lived spin order in the most efficient way. So we're going to go over some uh, very basic properties, which all of you are aware of. So I'll just gloss over it. You have spin half ensembles and isotropic liquids. Let's say in the most basic form, you have a J coupling, a scalar term coupling two spins. And you have a symmetry breaking element, typically a chemical shift difference, uh, uh, which, uh, yeah, introduces this uh, singlet triplet mixing. And here it's uh, very convenient to define this uh, quantity I like to call the mixing angle, which is over here, arc tan of a chemical shift difference over J. And you can also use the magnitude term, but I'm not going to be talking about that. But the important thing is that these systems support a singlet order and or long-lived eigenorder. And I'm going to be talking about what long-lived eigenorder actually means. So uh, here is a small animation. So what's going on here is you have a spin system, two spin half system with a J coupling of 10 Hertz and a chemical shift difference, which is uh, being varied uh, sequentially. 
And what you can see is uh, already you notice some aspects going on here. So you have a near equivalence regime where these outer transitions are basically invisible. You have a strong inequivalence regime, which let's say is the textbook case. You have a four peaks of almost equal transitions, maybe small roofing effect. And then you have this uh, intermediate equivalence regime, which is a uh, very interesting and a long-standing problem for many kinds of spin dynamics, namely in our case, how to generate long-lived order. So let's look at the general eigenstates of two spin half uh, spin systems. And what I've done here is by, I've denoted these states. So this uh, apostrophe here or prime uh, basically introduces uh, these coefficients to describe uh, what your uh, eigenkets are depending on your uh, single triplet mixing angle. And let's say that's your diagonalized two spin half Hamiltonian. And this is in the rotating frame. I've uh, cheated and removed, let's say, the enormous Larmor frequency terms. Uh, looks something like this. And let's say you have some uh, population operators you can make. So, a singlet order, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, it looks something like this. It's the population difference between the singlet state and the triplet manifold. But we can analogously define uh, something called long-lived eigenorder. And this actually has been called uh, many names like quasi-singlet order or singlet precursor order. And the next few slides, uh, the context behind these names will make uh, more sense. But let's say this is simply defined as uh, the population difference between this uh, S0 prime state or eigenstate and the uh, Let's say the T prime uh, eigenmanifold. And you end up, uh, even though, uh, let's say the general structure is the same, it's just a population difference uh, between the, these forms. The operator uh, can be uh, drastically different. Because uh, you start introducing this uh, I1z minus I2z term here. And uh, here I've done a little bit of demonstration. So singlet order obviously expressed in this uh, singlet triplet basis looks something like that. Very simple, very well known. When you express it in the Hamiltonian eigen basis, however, and assuming that you have a finite uh, singlet triplet mixing angle, you start introducing these uh, off diagonal uh, elements. And what that means is that by definition, as soon as you've broken magnetic equivalence, Singlet order is no longer an eigenorder. Uh, you start to get these uh, coherent effects, which may be undesirable. And now in this, for this long-lived eigenorder, you have the same thing, but in reverse. In the instantaneous eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, no matter what your theta is, you always have this uh, simple diagonal form. But if you take a fixed basis and express the operator in that, like whether it's a single lift, triplet basis or whether it's a steam basis, uh, you'll start getting a dependence. And here, one way I think that is a, one way I think which makes it a much clearer would be this uh, Heisenberg and Schrodinger picture that I'll go for in the next few slides. But let's say some very basic features. This long-lived eigenorder I'm talking about is a superposition of singlet order, the symmetry breaking a chemical shift term, that's here I1, Z minus I2, Z, and also ZZ order, which actually is often thrown out, but uh, maybe uh, we can get into that later. So what's happening here is you have this term I've called Q delta, I1z minus I2z in the Cartesian uh, operator picture. Or you can also express it as a product of uh, these singlet uh, triplet states, or you can express it as a product of these uh, uh, Zeeman uh, Ketbra states. So you can actually express your uh, long lived eigenorder as a sum of uh, cosines and sines of these. And uh, let's say that uh, 
due to symmetry bounds, again, a complicated issue I'll try to avoid. This uh, QZZ operator is often thrown out because uh, you can never access, let's say, 100% uh, singulatory, including uh, the I1X, I2X, and I1Y, and I2Y, and I1Z, I2Z. Uh, that's, not that's not possible due to symmetry bounds. You always uh, have some limit. But the usage of the term eigenorder emphasizes that, uh, as I mentioned before, this QPO is solely consisting of diagonal elements, which is the stationary states. And it doesn't evolve coherently in time. There is no off diagonals or any kind of oscillations going on. Now, let's say here it's very useful to uh, look at these classic quantum mechanical representations, which I just use as a thought experiment. Now, suppose you start with an initial operator. It could be QPO or QSO, singlet order or long-lived eigenorder. And you want to suppress your chemical shift difference term, which is typically done in the field by either B0 field cycling can go from high to low or low to high, or B1 spin locking, which have very different time scales. So what happens is that your singlet triplet mixing angle acquires a time dependence. But how do you characterize the actual net dynamics? Well, in these two uh, classical quantum mechanical pictures, you have the Heisenberg picture, where your operator amplitudes may vary in time, but your populations remain constant. The populations of your state vectors uh, do not change, which is opposed to the Schrodinger picture where your operator amplitudes remain constant, but your populations, uh, generally, they may vary in time. And uh, in modern language, this is often uh, described in terms of, let's say, adiabatic and diabatic uh, processes. And I understand that the term diabatic is uh, very controversial to many people. But uh, let's say that the way I use it is going to be synonymous with the uh, sudden approximation that appears in most quantum mechanical textbooks. So let's start with these basic definitions. An adiabatic transformation preserves the metric of populations. So your instantaneous eigenstate amplitudes are preserved throughout the evolution of your Hamiltonian. And a diabatic transformation preserves something else as the metric of your physical observables, that is your operator amplitudes, as a system's Hamiltonians transform. And let's say for adiabatic evolutions, we often idealize them as an infinitely slow change. And we call this the adiabatic approximation. And let's say this corresponds to what's happened in our labs when we do a slow field cycling, or we manually move a sample up and down a superconducting magnet. For diabatic evolution, on the other hand, uh, and again, I understand for many people, this is a controversial term. Uh, this is more synonymous with the sudden approximation. So let's say you apply a change that is so fast that uh, your Hamiltonian or your operator amplitudes uh, don't really have time to adjust. So whatever operator you had before is typically what you end up with after. So this corresponds to, uh, let's say, a uh, strong spin locking. And uh, important concept here is to think of uh, this uh, long-lived eigenorder, or QPO, as this adiabatically correlated singlet order, because it's the suitable uh, singlet precursor order, if you'd like to call it that, for the common situation where you have an initial chemical shift difference that you ramp down to uh, roughly zero. And you do it. Uh, approximately adiabatically or slowly. And let's say some main observations we have is that in the near equivalence limit, there is no difference between long-lived eigenorder and singlet order. They're the same thing. Uh, long-lived order uh, can't possibly be uh, better. They are reduced to the same thing in the absence of a chemical shift difference or a singlet triplet mixing angle term. And the second observation, so suppose you have a constant V0 field. You're not varying your field or anything. And in this field, you have a uh, 
finite or significantly large uh, symmetry breaking elements, your uh, singlet triplet mixing angle is fairly large. The chemical shift difference may be comparable to the J coupling. Then your long lived eigenorder is certainly not equivalent to your singlet order. And it's characterized by a relaxation constant T lambda, which in general is distinct from TS and T1. And so I propose that this may provide us uh, some additional information about our spin systems, about our molecules, and it could make for a nice uh, dynamical study. And again, at these constant V0 fields, where you have a significant mixing term, you can actually measure TS and T lambda separately, where the TS measurements, but not your T lambda measurements, would require strong spin locking to suppress some uh, troublesome coherent modulation. And let's say the final one, which corresponds to this uh, single precursor picture, is that in monotonically decreasing and ideally adiabatically decreasing B0 fields, and in the context of a uh, classic field cycling experiments, then this long lived eigenorder, or QPO, is your actual ideal precursor that you need to prepare. That let's say at your uh, final time interval after you're, you've taken your sample from high to low field, you would transform it, uh, you would transform your uh, starting order completely into singlet order. Of course, assuming no relaxation and perfect adiabaticity and all that. And let's say uh, what I'm saying here is I'm not claiming any novelty whatsoever. Here's a paper by uh, McCormick in 1967. Very old paper, and even then it came as no surprise that let's say, and this was a strongly in equivalent spin system, by the way, you had T1, simple, do an inversion recovery measure that. You had T2, simple, uh, excite transverse magnetization, measure how that evolves in time. But they also have this thing they call T delta, which corresponded to selective inversion of one spin. And what's amazing is that uh, some four decades later, this actually ended up being the first singlet NMR experiment. But instead of monitoring this uh, T delta at high field, uh, let's say that the starting operator, the selectively inverted spin, was generated through these pulse sequences and then adiabatically cycled to low field. And because they are adiabatically correlated operators, your I1z minus I2z gets transformed into a, something resembling singlet order, I1x dot I2x plus I1y dot I2y. So uh, these are uh, important concepts, both let's say for high field experiments, where you have a uh, maybe a huge, maybe a small, maybe intermediate chemical shift difference term. And also for uh, the classic uh, singlet NMR experiments with the uh, adiabatic field cycling, because now you know what, what uh, order or configuration of states you need to prepare at high field in order to have singlet order at low field. And here I'm just gonna go very quickly through some relaxation mechanisms. I mean, uh, they should be familiar to all of you. You have out of pair dipolar interactions, in pair dipolar relaxation, spin rotation, CSA tensors, and I have these uh, semi coherent relaxation mechanisms like singlet triplet leakage and uh, singlet scalar relaxation of the second kind, which I've uh, done twice here. Sorry about that. But anyway, let's go to some very basic uh, symmetry arguments. Let's define what a long lived operator is very loosely. Let's say it's any operator representing a special configuration of nuclear spin states. And usually it's a population difference emphasized between states of unlike permutation symmetries. And let's say that's ideally, and it's making a lot of assumptions and approximations, long lived order is invariant or significantly invariant or less affected or differently affected under some relaxation superoperator. And the classic example, which uh, Abraham uh, pointed out in his book, is a uh, singlet triplet transitions. And let's say using very basic arguments, uh, not lots of theory, 
uh, singlet triplet transitions cannot occur by symmetric perturbations like in pair dipole relaxation between two spins. And uh, just to compare the difference between, uh, let's say, this uh, long lived eigenorder operator and singlet order, let's do a case study on an in pair dipolar relaxation. So using very basic arguments, this is the extreme narrowing limit. This is making a lot of uh, approximations. This isn't any Lindblatian equation, very simple. Let's say you can arrive for, to the equation for a T1 or R1. And this relaxation rate is a standard result. It's known by everyone. You can also arrive at the result for a singlet order. There's also a standard result known to most people. It's not affected by in pair dipolar relaxation. But you can also get this uh, result for uh, your relaxation rate for the for relaxation rate for this long lived eigenorder. And you can get, let's say, assuming that this is your sole relaxation mechanism, you can get an expression for this uh, T lambda term. And as you can see, uh, it looks uh, quite different from both uh, TS and from T1. And uh, in this graph, I just illustrate uh, the ratio of this uh, T lambda relaxation time to T1. And you can see that's even in the strong and equivalence limit. Uh, it can be uh, four to five times uh, longer than T1. And this is an ideal case, ignoring all other uh, relaxation mechanisms. And let's say for the case of theta is zero, it just converges to singlet order, so nothing new there. Now you have to actually uh, wonder, how do you get these interesting operators? We've talked about them a lot, but there are just, uh, there's just a huge amount of uh, methods in the literature. And uh, what I will do is I will uh, restrain myself completely to hard pulse methods. And not because I think hard pulses are the best or that these are the only methods which work, but uh, this is out of my own ignorance and inexperience of the other methods. So I refer uh, anyone who's interested to uh, these names here. You have uh, methods like Slick, which was pioneered by a uh, the Rosen Lab and uh, Stephen Defense. You have a uh, shaped RF methods, ADSLIC, APSOC. You have hard pulse methods like the SARCAR sequence uh, developed in Jeffrey Bodenhausen's group. Uh, heavily underappreciated, I think, uh, sequences by uh, Stephen Kadlicek. And uh, ADAPT by uh, Gabriele Stevenato. You also have a family of echo based uh, methods like M2S and GM2S, which came out of our group. And also a GCM2S, which came out about the same time from uh, Stefan Glockler's group with uh, Salva Mamon. You even have the possibility of optimal control optimization, which is explored by the late uh, Kostya Ivanov and also other groups. You also have the possibility of doing uh, fast field sweeps and exploiting level crossings or anti-crossings which I have to say is uh, completely out of my depth. And I uh, recommend you to uh, my colleague, uh, Lauren Estegas, and also the extensive work that's been done by the late Costa Ivanov and his uh, excellent group. And again, one thing which uh, you're all familiar with is using direct hyperpolarization. So when you directly hyperpolarize, uh, you invariably uh, generate some component which uh, corresponds to singlet order. And depending on uh, how you deal with the singlet order, and depending on, uh, let's say you put it in a high magnetic field in a fast or in a slow way, you could end up with uh, any mixture of these operators. But uh, that's not the case I will analyze in any depth. Let's say that uh, we've arrived at these pulse sequences to generate uh, both a uh, singlet order. There's this GM2S sequence here. And also for the generation of long-lived eigenorder. 
So you'll notice this new pulse sequence here called uh, GSGP. Though what's going on here is that in your first step, you're generating singlet order. And now you have an intermediate step where uh, let's say you can apply a T00 filter. You can uh, apply anything you want to the singlet order. And then uh, you convert the singlet order into this long lip eigen order or more relevant in this case, a singlet precursor order. If you're planning on adiabatically cycling it to low field. The, let's say here, uh, and again, I have to apologize here because I've overlooked a lot of excellent methods in the field. But uh, here's a comparison of uh, some of the very first uh, pulse sequences. So here uh, in blue, there is this JAX 2004 sequence, which is uh, one of the very first sequences developed by our group to uh, generate singlet order that would later be uh, subjected to strong spin locking. There is the uh, M2S sequence, originally developed by our group to uh, deal with the uh, systems and the near equivalence limit. There is the SARCAR sequence in red, designed to uh, deal with the strong equivalence case. And here in black is just an uh, optimized version of this uh, SARCAR sequence. And here is the relatively new GM2S sequence, which we designed, let's say, to function optimally or relatively optimally in this range between a single triplet mixing angle between zero degrees and 67.5 degrees. And when it comes to the actual sequences that uh, excite this uh, long lived eigen order or single precursor order, uh, you don't have much. So, this was the sequence I referred to uh, earlier in my slides. This was the very first experiment to uh, actually uh, do singlet NMR. You can see the sequence is uh, not efficient uh, at all, it barely works. You can see ADAPT, on the other hand, has an almost maximal efficiency. And let's say in this near equivalence limit, where there's not much difference between your singlet order, order and long lived eigen order anyway, uh, it doesn't really make a difference whether you use any specialized sequence. They converge into the same operator. And here in black again, this was a numerical experiment where we tried making some uh, numerically optimized free pulse sequence. Let's say for this uh, GS2P sequence, uh, it essentially consists of a spin echo n times characterized by a delay tau nested inside this other thing. And you basically repeat these cycles. And then we found it very convenient, uh, let's say, to set this m value to a fixed parameter. So you could have one cycle, two cycles, or four. And uh, after a lot of work, uh, you end up with these uh, analytical expressions. Hey, Mo, uh, cutting to the chase. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're nearly out of time. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, you can see here that uh, the sequence is very optimal for a singlet to precursor the conversion. The, let's say this is our experimental scheme, which again, you start out by making singlet order. You subject this to a T00 filter to remove any uh, impure components. You convert this to a long lived eigen order, and now you have the choice. You can either observe this long lived eigen order at high field, or you can cycle it to low field where it gets transformed into singlet order. And just uh, for completeness, at the beginning of our experiments, you have these uh, singlet purge cycles to remove any residual long lived uh, order. So we tested this in these model systems. As you can see, uh, there's a range of uh, equivalence regimes here. Uh, the spin parameters are here. J couplings are about 185 hertz. And uh, let's say you're able to observe a high field, a mono exponential long lived component, which is not characterized by a singlet order, at least outside the near equivalence regime. I mean, this picture, I guess most of us will be familiar with. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, whether you do uh, just M2S or you convert that or whatever. 
But when you get to the intermediate equivalence regime, where there is a difference between singlet order and this long lived eigen order, in general, making singlet order may not always be the best choice because you would get a lot of uh, coherent oscillations and it will be just very difficult to measure. And again, a system like this with large interactions, uh, strong spin locking may not be the safest thing to do for your probe. So let's say we're able to uh, measure these at high field. And we compare that with the simple TS experiment combined with the spin locking and without spin locking. And you can see that uh, these relaxation times, while they're the same with an experimental error, let's say in this near equivalence limit, when you start getting a large chemical shift difference term, they're very distinct. So in this system, for example, we have T1 13 seconds, roughly T lambda 24 seconds and TS 50 seconds. And the next thing you want to do is uh, transfer your uh, long lived eigen order, where now it's better to use the term singlet precursor order to low field to monitor your singlet order at low field. And we did this with all of these systems. And uh, to our surprise, uh, this wasn't the intent of the project at all. We ended up discovering some uh, extremely long uh, nuclear singlet lifetimes. And what we did was we compare, compare it doing just uh, an M2S experiment and field cycling with this additional GS2P step. So again, in the near equivalence limit, there's no point whatsoever in doing any additional steps. Your chemical shift difference term is very small anyway. When you get into intermediate equivalence, so you get these very interesting effects. So let's say in this isoprofile ester, or your singlet triplets uh, mixing angle is about 40 degrees. Doing the additional GS2P step gives you this very clean and uh, roughly mono exponential decay. You just have this uh, small component at the beginning. Whereas just doing uh, an M2S step gets you all of these uh, unwanted oscillations and is a much shorter to your curve. We didn't see these oscillations when you moved to the system with a single triplet mixing angle of about uh, 60 degrees. But to our surprise, what we found was that uh, with this GS2P step, you preserve about uh, twice of your magnetization, which you can see by looking at these uh, normalized axes. And the reason why this experiment was suspended here is because we ran out of observable magnetization. So after that, it was uh, just noise basically. But uh, yeah, in conclusion, uh, we found some uh, nice sequences for generating uh, both singlet order and its uh, adiabatically correlated equivalent, whatever you want to call it, beyond the approximations of a strong and weak in equivalence. And uh, in the process, uh, we ended up finding a new family of molecule uh, supporting ultra long lived order beyond an hour in solution. So before that, there was just one molecule that was an ethylene derivative. And that was basically the benchmark for the field. So now it's nice that we have additional toys to play with. And so even though I know nothing about parahydrogen, and I don't want to make any uh, crazy statements and embarrass myself, I hope that uh, these may potentially have some applications uh, to the field. I'll say whether for storage of magnetization, or uh, reading out as much of your uh, hyperpolarization as possible. And yeah, at the end, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge everyone who's helped me with this. For my supervisor, Malcolm, uh, my colleagues, uh, Christian, uh, Laureness, Linda, Johans, uh, Jamal, Andrew. And let's say from uh, Pepe Pelea's group, uh, Pepe himself and also Andrew Hall. And yeah, that's the end of my talk. All right, thank you very much, Mohammed. Uh, those are some amazingly long uh, times you've got there. Uh, uh, we're over time, uh, but I will ask one question uh, and I uh, hope all the other questions can go to the Slack uh, uh, so that we can still get them discussed. So I'll ask uh, Lexi Yershaw's question. Uh, for the extremely long lifetimes that you spoke about in the beginning, do you ever have to worry about sample convection or B1 inhomogeneity in order to measure it properly? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So all of that stuff uh, went on behind the scenes. So it's not just, uh, you have to exercise extreme diligence. You know, these are the most sensitive NMR samples we know in liquid NMR today. So not only do you have to perform a several degassing cycles, but you have to take extreme care to limit convection and B1 and homogeneity effects. So these samples are actually all prepared in uh, Shigemi tubes to uh, limit those effects. And we made them as a small volume as possible. <laughs>